Okay, so we've got another lightning talk on the Pictor telescope, a free to use and open source radio telescope. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Apostolos. Uh, in this lightning talk, I will present to you a Pictor, which is a, a free to use and open source radio telescope that allows uh, anyone from uh, all around the world to, to observe the radio sky for free. Uh, so uh, let, let's start with a little uh, introduction. So this is our galaxy. Uh, I think most of you have already seen this image, maybe. Uh, but how did we take this image? Well, of course, we didn't send a spaceship there. That's a bit too far. But uh, so how did we compose it? Well, we synthesized it. This is an artist's conception, uh, mostly using radio astronomy. Uh, so you know, if, you, if you've seen the, uh, the galaxy at night, the Milky Way band, uh, you may not really be able to tell uh, if, if we even live in a spiral galaxy. So today we'll try to prove this to you uh, with a live observation. So let's start with uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. I think you've all seen this uh, sketch. Uh, so in the middle part we have the visible spectrum. This is the spectrum that we see with our own eyes. Uh, this is where most astronomy takes place in. And of course, we have some invisible uh, wavelengths like uh, X-rays, gamma rays, infrared, ultraviolet, microwaves, and of course, radio, which I will focus on today. So now, under certain conditions, hydrogen, a neutral hydrogen atom can emit radiation, a photon with a wavelength of 21 centimeters. This is called the spin-flip transition, um, which is responsible for the production of, the, of these waves. And as you know, our galaxy is full of, full of hydrogen. So we can detect the, these spiral alarms. You see, this is an old sky map, and in the center we have the Milky Way, uh, hence why it's so uh, bright in, at 420 megahertz. This, is, this corresponds to a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So we wanted to build a radio telescope that can detect this very, very faint radiation and make it available to everyone uh, to use online for free, without any registration, advertisements, or anything like that. So we began uh, planning some, uh, uh, we began with some simulations for the antenna. Uh, this is a Fithorn simulation uh, using electromagnetic solvers. Uh, this is a simulated radiation pattern. And after that, we decided to build the, the antenna and uh, got it measured in the lab. This is the, telecommun the telecommunication systems laboratory uh, of the Department of Digital Systems at the University of Piraeus. Uh, we got the graphs uh, and everything. This is S11 of the monopole for those familiar with uh, RF systems. And of course, we, me we measured the entire Fithorn. Uh, which made, it, made the monopole a bit uh, more wideband. So let's look at some stats. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, got, uh, it's a parabolic antenna with a diameter of 1.5 meters, so it's a large dish. Uh, it can operate from, from 1300 to 1700 megahertz, so if anyone doesn't want to observe the hydrogen line, uh, he can look at a different frequency. Uh, the half power beam width, this is like the field of view, uh, it's about 9 degrees. And uh, most importantly, uh, it's got a filtered LNA, very low noise amplifier with a 0.5 dB noise figure. And of course, it's fully open source. So anyone uh, can uh, take the code and uh, build his own. Uh, so this is what the telescope looks like uh, in its current form. And uh, this, is, this is basically the, the, the data acquisition flow graph, the G digital signal processing. It's based on polyphase filter bank spectrometer. Uh, this is GNU Radio, um, many of you know this, and uh, you can find the full documentation here. On, uh, I've, I've made a separate documentation just for, for this flow graph. So, uh, how does it work? The signal enters the feed horn, gets amplified, filtered, and then amplified. This is a two-stage low-nose amplifier, and runs through a three-meter low-loss uh, low co co coaxial cable. Then it runs through a Faraday cage to reduce uh, spurious emissions to, to the telescope, which is undesired runs through BIST and SDR, and of course, Raspberry Pi. So, let's, uh, why don't we make an observation? So, to make an observation, a user simply, uh, simply goes to pictortelescope.com, and you can scroll down. Uh, I've got the GitHub here and everything. Check some uh, information out. And I've also written a PDF in English. You can uh, take a look at that. It has some introductory uh, radio astronomy information. Uh, so maybe that's uh, something you're interested in for beginner users, for example. So we have here uh, some, uh, a form. It tells you where the telescope is, po is uh, pointing to. Uh, right now it's uh, in Zenith, so direct overhead. So it allows us to, uh, for example, uh, put an observation name like uh, 
like false is an example. Uh, center frequency, we want, to do, we want to observe the hydrogen line, so 420 megahertz sounds reasonable. Uh, bandwidth, uh, you can go up to 3.2 uh, megahertz, but 2.4 is uh, usually sufficient. Uh, then we have the number of channels. This is the FFT size. Uh, 2048 is usually fine. It's more than enough. Uh, and you have the number of bins, which basically determines the integration time per FFT sample. Uh, so you, this won't really affect your signal-to-noise ratio. It's usually for uh, interference mitigation uh, and, uh, and other kinds of things. So duration, let's just put uh, 20 seconds and uh, input uh, our email address. So if we hit, uh, oops, okay, uh, let's run this again. Uh, so we said FOS them. Okay, 20 second duration and our email address. Okay. All right, let's uh, hit enter, okay. So now the observation is running and the telescope just picks up this uh, this observation, let's actually look into this in uh, more detail. So what happens is uh, the user uh, loads the observation page, checks, uh, the server checks if, the, if there is an observation running, and if not, it permits the user to submit an observation with his uh, desired parameters. So then the telescope awaits the observation request, checks if, has, if it has already been run, and if not, then uh, it runs the observation, does uh, some digital signal processing, uh, including uh, RFI mitigation, uh, etc., and then sends the, uh, the data to the observer via email. So the user, the user can just uh, go into his email and uh, check the observation data. So I think we should have received uh, the observation now. Let's give it a second. It usually takes uh, maybe a minute or two for uh, the email to arrive. Okay, there we go. So we have here the, the observation uh, parameters that we entered, uh, bandwidth, sample rate, number of channels, and, and everything. And over here we have the, the graphs, so the, the telescope data. So we have four graphs in total. This is the average spectrum, this is the calibrated spectrum, so this is what the SDR receives, and you can see a very faint peak there, but you also see some three humps. So this, this is called the bandpass shape, and it's due to the, it's like an SDR uh, artifact. So if we calibrate that, it becomes flat, and we can see the hydrogen line a lot more clearer. So uh, what, what we see here in this, uh, in this peak, this is the hydrogen line. This corresponds to uh, a unique spiral arm in our galaxy. Specifically, this is the, the Cygnus uh, arm, so our host spiral arm of, uh, of a uh, solar system. And we have two more graphs. Uh, the waterfall, which basically shows you the, the entire data. Uh, it's just not very easy to see, hence why you have uh, some, more, some more graphs. And of course, uh, power versus time. Okay, so if we go back to the presentation. Okay, so this is another exam example observation taken at an even, even better time. You can see three, uh, three peaks here. So each, each of those uh, peaks corresponds to a different uh, spiral arm in our galaxy. So with just uh, an observation, which this, you can get such data in like 60 seconds, for example. You have proven, you have detected three unique spiral arms of the galaxy. So you've proven that the Milky Way is indeed, like we do indeed, li we do indeed live in a spiral galaxy which is not very easy to prove uh, using optical measurements. So let's look at, uh, let's look at some uh, statistics. So uh, PICTOR has been used uh, from 360 plus unique users from uh, all around the world. Uh, we have uh, 2.3 thousand observations on the archive. Uh, imagine our goal was uh, to hit uh, 100 unique users in a year. And in less than a year, in just a few months, we, we reached so many users, which is great. Uh, and these users include uh, students, teachers, uh, educators, uh, professors, uh, amateurs, and uh, even professional astronomers. Uh, so, some future plans. Uh, we have a lot of plans for, for the future regarding radio astronomy. 
Uh, one of them is the development of a similar uh, educational instrument for, uh, for pulsar uh, education and maybe be part of research uh, as part of the pulsar monitoring network, which will be dedicated for, uh, for glitch research. Uh, pulsar glitch is basically uh, an, an open issue, in, uh, an open problem in science because uh, what, what it means is the pulsar, a pulsar is uh, a neutron star, uh, it presents a sudden, a sudden uh, decrease, a sudden change in the in the in the spin period. So we're looking to uh, research more into that, and of course we have uh, LiRaNet, which is uh, which will be a global network of open source radio telescopes. Uh, this include uh, some small and large dishes. The largest one right now is uh, 18 meters in diameter. So it's a huge, huge dish, and we have some uh, many, many more. And this, this uh, network will be for uh, research and education as well. Uh, so we have uh, plenty of plans for that. And um, last but not least, uh, we'd like to thank uh, Libre Space Foundation for their support and uh, the support with the stickers and also helping us build another antenna that will, all, that will also be part of uh, Laronet. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. And of course, uh, feel free to take any stickers you want uh, from over there, and uh, I'll be happy to take some questions. What, yeah. What's the cost of buying of designing a telescope? Okay, so the question is, uh, what's the cost of designing the such telescope? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it depends uh, on the diameter, of course, and uh, what backend you will use and what RF frontend. So maybe you, you want to go with uh, some even lower noise amplifiers, some better filters, um, a larger dish, uh, you know, maybe you want to make it more wideband. Uh, so there's a lot of options. Uh, you can design a telescope like Picter for, uh, uh, you know, uh, a few hundred bucks, maybe less. Uh, we just designed a new one called Nano RT, Nano Radio Telescope, which looks like an optical telescope. It's, it's very, very small. Um, this, this costed under a hundred. So, there's a lot of uh, possibilities, and if anyone wants to uh, to build a radio telescope, they can really do this. I mean, I've written uh, all the software for you, so you don't have to go through this work as well. Any more questions? Yes. Uh, so the telescope basically uh, points uh, constantly to zenith. So you can use, uh, students can use something like, uh, like a planetarium, a virtual planetarium software like uh, Stellarium to, uh, to see where the telescope is pointing to. So uh, the, the elevation sometimes changes, for example, uh, on requests, uh, like uh, if a student wishes to observe the moon or the sun, for example, then they tell us, uh, can, you, can you please shift it uh, to a certain elevation? And uh, they, they often perform a drift scan observation. So uh, they don't have, in the case of the moon and the sun, you don't have to observe at 14, 20 megahertz because you're not looking to observe the hydrogen line. You're looking to observe something uh, much closer. Uh, so in the case of, uh, of a sun or a lunar, lunar uh, drift scan observation, you, you, what you're looking for is the um, power versus time. Uh, in this case, you, sh you should see the power uh, being mostly flat and slowly rising, uh, forming a, a Gaussian curve, and then, you know, uh, going straight, like, so you, you basically see a peak when the, uh, uh, when the sun or moon enters your, uh, your field of view, the beam of the telescope. Any, any more questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.